Oh, I started talking and I didn't have my mic unmuted. Uh, we're going to get started very shortly. Uh, let me see how many people are in here. It looks like there's 15. Uh, more people will start filtering in. We're going to get started in a minute or two. So fill your water, use the restroom, pet your cat. And then get ready for chemistry. Let me put that on the screen here. All right, it's 5 p.m. Um, I have my clock here. So the way that this is going to work is I am going to... First, let me click on this so that I'm on the right screen. Uh, lectures go for about two hours from 5 to 7. We're going to take a 10-minute break every hour. Uh, that only ends up being one break. I didn't think through that sentence very much. Um, during the lectures, please feel free to use the chat to talk about anything that you want to with your fellow students. Uh, if you have questions for me, make sure that you preface them with some sort of thing. Uh, let me see if this actually works. Oh, it's going to make me... It's going to show up my thing. How about exclamation point? Is that an emoji, emoji? I don't know. I don't know. Put something in front of it like this. And let me know, like, here's a question for Wes... I don't know, something like that. Just put like a symbol or a smiley face or something like that. So I'll see those. Try to use emotes sparingly just because I'll be looking for them because I'm trying to read this screen in real time while I'm talking to you. Also, the chat is moderated. Please refrain from typing in anything that is inappropriate. Um, it may flag some things randomly. So if your question just disappears um, and it's a valid question and then YouTube just caught it for some reason, I will try and free it in just a second. Um... I did have somebody in my earlier chat say something that didn't get filtered because I didn't have the mode toggled, and uh, that was a problem. Uh, so I am going to be moderating the chat. Uh, how did I come up with that name for my cat? I actually named it after a character in a video game. Uh, all of the characters are named after various like deities and spirits and things like that, and apparently a Kresnik is like a Romanian vampire hunter or something like that. Uh, the real story behind that is that the cat's original name was Keshik, which was one of the choices on the orientation thing. Uh, I wanted to change his name slightly so that he would be my cat, because I adopted him from a friend, uh, along with Maya, her, uh, or my cat's uh, other cat. And uh, so now they both live with me. Uh, okay, so that should be everything about the chat, and a little bit about my cats, because hooray cats... Uh, hopefully you have printed out the chapter one slides, or at least download them and have them accessible. Uh, we're going to get started, and your slide should look something like this. We're going to go through chapter one today, because chapter one is not very long. Uh, is there a lecture or live stream tomorrow? No, so tomorrow on, which is Wednesday this week, if you're looking at the uh, archive, uh, Wednesday for week one, there will be no q and It says that on the bottom of your screen. So those announcements, uh, will generally say, like, what's coming up, what will be due. We don't really have anything due. So the next lecture this week will be Thursday. Um, yeah, I mean, if you have any other questions, ask them to me real quick before we get started. Oh, your message disappeared. Okay, so yeah, you find it. <laughs> Yeah, you can delete your own messages. That's totally fine. All right. Chapter one is an introduction to chemistry. And chemistry, it turns out, is a study of stuff. And I mean that literally. Like, stuff. Looking around your desk where you are sitting right now, there is probably a computer or a tablet or a phone in front of you that is made of stuff. Inside that thing are other things. And they all interact with each other in some way. Our job in this class particularly to try and tailor it to your experiences in allied health and the medical profession is how does this stuff interact with people more or less? Like how do chemicals affect us? Because you obviously need to understand that in order to administer medicine, uh, what appropriate dosage information is, things like that. So we're going to talk about matter in this first chapter and talk about all the things you can do with it and how we categorize it in chemistry. So the first thing we want to talk about is, well, what is matter? 
Matter is defined as anything that has these two properties in common. And let me grab my pen, and I gotta find my highlighter. Oops, that didn't work. There we go. So these right here. For something to be matter, it has to meet these two qualifications. It has to take up space. What that means is that matter can only exist in one space, and nothing else can occupy that space at the same time. So if I put my phone down, and then I put something on top of my phone... The, the phone cannot occupy the same region of space as, like, say, a pen that I put on it. Those two things would displace one another. The other property is that they have, must have mass. Anything that has stuff in it, so like any atoms or molecules or whatever, has mass because those objects have a weight to them. We are going to define anything as matter that has those two properties in common. Now, there are some things that don't fit those properties, and thus we don't call them matter. For example, light. Light doesn't have a mass, so we can't call light matter. Heat doesn't have a mass. Heat is just sort of this energy sort of thing. In fact, things that aren't matter we call energy, for the most part. There are some exceptions that are beyond the scope of this class, but for the most part we're going to stick to the domain of matter, and we're going to play around with it and see all the things that we can do. Finally, to summarize what we're going to be doing in this course, again, Chemistry is the study of how matter behaves. If you put two pieces of matter in close proximity with each other, maybe they react, maybe they don't. Both of those are important. For example, your clothing is made of matter. If that clothing reacted with you when you put it on, that wouldn't serve very well as clothing. You'd get a chemical burn. So we probably shouldn't be making our pants out of acid or base or whatever. Uh, likewise, if you're trying to accomplish a task and you need to do a reaction to do that, for example, neutralize stomach acid, maybe you have indigestion, you don't want to drink something that is also acidic. That will just exacerbate the problem. How do we know what works and how do we don't? Or how do we know it doesn't work? That's going to be the, pro the focus of this class. Matter is going to come in three primary forms at you. In this class, we're going to stick to these three types of matter. And we're going to define matter as having certain traits in these two classifications, shape and volume. For each of these, they have a unique characteristic. For example, a solid, such as your phone. If you try and change the shape of your phone, that is going to be very, very difficult to do without a lot of force. We would say that the shape of your phone, or maybe the shape of your glass of water, or the shape of the little, like, statue that you have at your desk or whatever. I have a little owl that a friend of mine got from Mexico. It's in a very fixed shape. It can't be changed. Because of that, its volume is also fixed. The amount of space that it occupies cannot be changed. With liquids, it's a little bit different. With a liquid, you have a fixed volume, but the shape depends on the container it's in. Where did I put my pen? There it is. So if I do this, let's go to this screen. I'm going to have to work a bit on what's going on at the top there. You can't really see what's going on in the lecture, but that's okay. Uh, click on this. All right, so if I draw in here, you should be able to see it. That didn't work. That also didn't work. There we go, that worked. Okay. So let's suppose that you have a container. Here's my container. And it has a liquid in there. And we say that it has some volume. We'll just say it's 10 for now. If I had another container that had a different shape, and this was the line for 10, and I poured this guy into here, and asked you, how much would it fill it up? Well, you'd say, well, obviously it'd go to the same amount, because it's the same volume. But as you can see, this shape that I have here is very different than the shape that I have here. Pardon my drawing, it's hard to get used to a tablet. So the shapes for liquids are different, but the volumes that are contained within them will be the same. Gases break both of those rules. Gases have a volume that just depends on what container you put it in. Gases will always expand to fill their container. So their shape and their volume will be whatever it is in the container that you're using. For example, if you take a deep breath and you hold the air in your lungs... The air that is currently in them is the shape of your lungs, but when you exhale, that air then goes out into the room that you're in, and the air is now the shape of the room. We're going to use those definitions to define matter in different ways. 
and to be able to tell the difference between them. And that's it for the first section. <laughs> so this is going to go really quickly. Uh, your textbook, which hopefully you've acquired or have on the way, will go over a lot of this stuff in some of it in more detail than is necessary. I think there's like three pages on like what solids, liquids, and gases are. Obviously, I'm going to make that a little shorter because we want to go over all this material in the two hours. For the most part, if I cover it on the lecture, it's important. If you see it in the textbook and I don't go over it in the lecture, you don't have to know that information to that level of detail. If you aren't sure, ask me a question, type it in the chat, post it on the discussion board, send me an email, any of those work, and I can give you more information. So now that we have a brief overview of what matter is, let's talk about how we can manipulate it. So the first thing we want to do is we want to discuss some things that we can do to matter. These are all actions that you could take with any example piece of matter that you have. I'm going to use a piece of paper uh, for my example here. If I have a piece of paper, I could heat it up. And I probably can't melt paper. I could heat and melt ice, for example. But if I did other things to this paper, like maybe I pour a liquid on it and it, it changes color or it might even cause it to react, like it might cause it to be flammable, or it might even just like start burning on its own. Maybe if I put it into water, it will like disintegrate. I might be able to recover it by getting rid of that water, or maybe I won't, depending on the other matter. Or maybe I could just take the paper and do other things, like I could fold it, or I could measure how long it is along one edge, or I could find its mass. I could do all sorts of things with this paper. But some of those things will irreversibly change the nature of the paper. It won't be paper anymore. If I set it on fire, mm, that's not going to be the same as what it was before. If I weigh it, it's still paper, though. What we're going to try and do in this section is we're going to try and identify what sorts of actions completely change the identity of the matter irreversibly. And when I say irreversibly, I mean it's not easy to get it back to how it once was. Some actions that we do, however, will not change the nature of the, of the matter in question, and it will be pretty trivial to change them back. We're going to use that as our rubric to get started, and then we're going to dive a little deeper and ask ourselves, what's going on at the molecular level? Are the molecules the same? Or are we just moving them around, or are we completely changing those molecules? So let's look at some examples here. First of all, let's talk about some properties of matter that help us distinguish things from other things. And that could be as simple as, oh, this thing weighs one gram, but this other thing weighs five. Therefore, they must be different. This is a liquid and this is a solid. Therefore, they must be different. This tastes great. This doesn't taste great. These are all properties. Anything that you can describe as a characteristic or trait of something is a property. A property of soda, for example, is that it tastes sweet, or maybe that it is caramel colored, or maybe that it has a red label on its bottle. That would differentiate it from a bottle that had a clear or colorless substance that had a green label on it, for example. When I use the word change, what I'm going to mean by that is that I'm going to change my matter in some way. It won't be what I started with. For example, that could be I left an ice cube out and it melted. And now it's water. It's no longer an ice cube. So it changed in some way. Uh, if I leave like a bagel on the on my uh, counter and I don't eat it for like two weeks or something, uh, it could get moldy and then it will turn green and then I certainly won't want to eat it. Um, other things will do other actions depending on the nature of what that matter is. With those two terms in mind, let's look at some sample actions and try and categorize them. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to describe our plan of attack. How do we identify if something changes before and after? The term that we're going to use here is something that's going to be a little foreign, at least at the start here. And so we're going to use this right here. We're going to look at the chemical formula of our substance. And the key words that we want to look at are the identity of it before and after we do an action. Now, chemical formulas are something that you will slowly learn as the quarter goes on. Some of them you may be familiar with. For example, water. Water has a very simple formula. I'm sure everybody has heard of H2O. H2O is the chemical formula of matter. It has two H's and an O in it. What are those things, H and O? 
We'll talk about that a little bit more when we get to the periodic table. For now, you'll pick up these formulas as we go through the course, but the important thing to note is that we want to know, does the formula change before and after? Again, since we don't really know formulas super well, that's going to be difficult, but we can make some guesses based on behavior. And this is where that whole, can I change it back to what it was thing comes in. If you can, then that's going to mean one thing. And if you cannot, that's going to mean something else. So for example, let's look at an ice cube. Let me put all the stuff on the board here. Here I have an ice cube. An ice cube is frozen water. If I take my ice cube and I let it melt, so I'm going to just leave it on the counter. I'm going to let it sit at room temperature while it melts. And then eventually it will just be a puddle of water inside my cup or on the counter or whatever. If I were to put that water back in the freezer, I could change it back into an ice cube. That's a pretty simple change. All we have to do is add or remove a little bit of heat. When we look at that at the chemical level, the formula for ice, since it's just frozen water, must still be H2O. And for water, like we said before, it is also H2O. If we do an action to something and its formula remains the same, or in other words, you can change it back relatively easily, we're going to call that a physical property or physical action. So physical changes or properties will involve things that we can do that don't change our matter at the molecular level. It stays the same. And because it stays the same, we don't have to do any chemistry to change it back. We just do simple stuff like heat it up or shape it back to what it was or whatever. So physical properties are going to be very common. Very commonly, they are phase changes. Oops, I don't know where my picture went. I must have touched the screen. I must be clicked on the wrong thing. There we go. So commonly phase changes are going to be important or anything that you observe. So if you just look at something or measure it and you don't actually interact with it other than with your eyes or maybe a tool, those are going to be physical observations, properties, or changes. Another example would be if I gave you a piece of paper. I don't know why my thing isn't advancing anymore. Hold on. Uh-oh, technical difficulties. Hold on. What window am I on? Hmm. I don't know why this isn't working, and I can't even get out of this window. Let me go back to my arrow. Wow, why is that going backwards? That's not what should be happening. I can, I can probably make this work for a second. Okay, I'll just use the mouse wheel. Apologies for the technical issue. Did the video freeze? Uh, it shouldn't have. Let me test something. Test. Oh, that's not what I want. Why is my keyboard all screwed up? Okay, interesting. I can't type anything. It's like I have the control key held down or something. There we go. That's working now. Okay. Okay, there we go. That seems to be working now. My keyboard was, like, misbehaving. So everything should be okay. Um, there may be some transmission errors. I My internet is pretty good, but YouTube can, like, crap out at times. Let me see if this works now. This worked. Okay, cool. So there should be a picture on your screen now that shows a piece of paper. Okay, so it looks like everything is okay. All right, back to our discussion on matter. So I have a piece of paper here, and I'm tearing it along this. Those aren't my hands, by the way. I'm tearing it along this very strange-looking sort of guide, I guess, to make the paper look ragged and old. Now, with paper, we don't know the chemical formula of it. I'm going to just put a question mark here to show you that. But what we can note about the paper is that before and after we tear it, and let me get my highlighter back, even though we don't know the formula, we can infer some things about the paper based on its properties. So if you have a piece of paper and you tear it in half, 
you can still write on both halves of the paper. It's just a little smaller. You could still fold it into a paper airplane. You could draw a picture on it. You could do all sorts of stuff. It's still paper. It still functions like paper. Therefore, if I were to tear paper, we would say that that is a physical change. It's the same paper, just smaller. But what if I took right here, I have a lighter, and I could use the lighter to set the paper on fire. If I set the paper on fire, is it paper after the fire goes out? And the answer to that very obviously is, well, no, it's not paper anymore. Now it's just a bunch of ashes. Can you do the same thing with paper that you can do with ashes? And with a little thought, you probably come to the conclusion that, well, no, I can't draw on the ashes. I can draw with ashes. I can make like a cave drawing sort of thing. But I can't actually use the ashes as a medium to draw something on or write a letter and then give it to you and have you read it. The paper allowed us to do that, but the ashes themselves do not. Since these two things have very different traits to them, we must have transformed the matter in some fundamental way. But more importantly, can you turn the ashes back into paper easily? Let me get my pen out. Can I do this easily? And it turns out that the answer is we can't. So we can't... My handwriting is bad. Hold on. Can't transform back easily. So if we can't turn something back into what it was easily, like heat it up gently or melt it or whatever, then what we would conclude is these two things are fundamentally different. We would have to do a chemical reaction, and the chemical reaction here would be, oh, I would bury the ashes, put a plant in them, and then the plant would grow and absorb the ashes, which would turn it into paper, or it would turn it into a tree, and then we'd cut the tree down and turn it into paper. That's not easy. So we would conclude that chemistry must have occurred here. There must have been a chemical change that transformed the paper into the ashes because their nature is just so different that it's essentially irreversible and the properties of the two things before and after are, are unique, more or less. So that's an overview of chemical and physical changes. Your task is to determine whether the listed action that I give for a quantity of matter constitutes something that is a physical change, which means you can restore it very easily, or a chemical change, which means that you cannot. Okay. Now, because this is a chemistry class, we're going to concern ourselves with chemi chemical changes primarily. What that means is, and on the board here, I have a chemical reaction. I got to get my highlighter back out. What I start with is not what I ended with. So these are different things before and after. Because of that, I have done a chemical change. Now for physical properties and stuff, we're not going to write reactions like this. In fact, we're probably not going to write reactions for a very long time. This first section is just a little bit of an overview of, hey, here's a bunch of things that you're going to eventually see. So don't freak out if you're like, oh, I have no idea what that sentence is saying at the top there. What's Al? And what is he doing in my lecture? Don't worry about that too much. But what's important is that on the left, I have things. And on the right, I have things. And those two things are different from each other. Therefore, chemistry happened. So let's dial back to a few more common examples that you might have around your home or might have interacted with. I'm going to put a bunch of these on the board here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you about three or four minutes to try and identify these properties of these substances. And what I want you to do is your answer for each of these. Where'd my marker go? There it is. What I want you to do is for each of these, I want you to either select physical or chemical to describe whether the stated transformation is physical or chemical. So for example, number one, water is boiled and I'm going to use the water to make pasta. In the act of boiling my water, did I change it into something completely different or could I get it back? And then do that for the remainder of the choices. We'll talk about what the homework practice means at the bottom, 
But for now, go ahead and get started on these problems. And in about four minutes, I will come back and we'll go over the answers. I will still be around, so if you have questions, you can type them in the chat. But I do want to give you a bit of silence so you don't hear me constantly harping in your voice while you're trying to solve them. Good luck. We're all counting on you.
All right, I'll give you a second to finish up. And we'll go over the answers. That's not the pen. There's the pen. All right. So what we're going to want to do when we look at these is we're going to look for keywords that help us figure out, hey, is this a phase change and something I can reverse? Or is this going to be something that's an irreversible change? So for the first example, with water is boiled to make delicious pasta, you want to try and find the keyword. And the keyword is right here. What does it mean to boil something? Now, when you put water on the stovetop and you turn on the heater to start it to boil, the water does slowly boil away. Where does it go? It goes into the atmosphere because it's now steam. It's a gas. But if that steam hits something and then cools down, it will turn into liquid water. You can actually see that effect in the shower. If you turn the uh, shower on really, really hot, then condensation starts to form on all the mirrors and stuff because the mirrors are cold. So boiling is actually just a phase change, which is the phase change from liquid to gas. And that's pretty reversible. All we have to do is cool the water back down and we get it back. So boiling water must be a physical process. All right, hopefully everybody got number one. Number two, grape soda is observed to be purple. So let's underline that in color. If you look at something, that something that you have looked at will remain the same. Unless you have like crazy x-ray eyes in which uh, seek professional help. But for the rest of us, oh, that's, I clicked on the thing. Hold on. Okay. I tapped my pen. That's what happened. Okay. For the rest of us, grape soda is just grape soda. If you look at it, it's still grape soda. We have not changed it in any way. So that will be a physical process as well. For the next one, Alka-Seltzer dissolved in water, the important words are this, releasing a gas, and dissolved. Now, the word dissolved is a little bit tricky. Lots of things will dissolve in water. For example, salt will dissolve in water. Sugar will dissolve in water. Alka-Seltzer will dissolve in water. But by itself, it doesn't really tell us if it's physical or chemical. We need to look for more information. And that's where the releasing a gas part comes in. On its own, does water or Alka-Seltzer release gas? I mean, hopefully not. If it does, again, you should probably not be drinking that water. But when you put the two together, it starts making bubbles of gas, and they bubble out, and you get this carbonated beverage, and it tastes very different because of the Alka-Seltzer inside. If you tried to recover the Alka-Seltzer, you actually can't do that. Like, if it's gone. It's and add to the water and what's it what is reacting in there has bubbled out because of that we would say this is a chemical reaction since i can't recover the alka-seltzer it's no longer alka-seltzer it's now whatever the other stuff is in there whatever salt was used to make it how about sodium metal you've probably never encountered sodium metal before you've encountered sodium as table salt but that is actually a different type of sodium that we're going to encounter in Chapter 4. For now, in this problem, you can actually ignore the fact that this is sodium metal. And we can just look at it. Oh, if I have a metal and then I melt it, well, what happens if I melt anything? This would turn from a solid into a liquid. How do I get it back? Well, if I melted it by, say, heating it up, I would just cool it back down, and then it would become a solid. It would still be sodium, so I would say that this is a physical change. Number five, the gunpowder in a bullet is ignited. If you ignite anything, you basically set it on fire. But what you'll note about gunpowder or anything that you ignite, like a candle or whatever, once you've burned it, it's kind of gone. Uh, if you burn wood or paper or something like that, or fuel in your lighter or something like that, uh, that material goes away and you can't recover it without just going and getting more wood or something like that. Uh, because of this, 
that change would be considered to be irreversible, and we would say it must be a chemical change. For the air in the scuba tank example, if this is my air to start, and then I compress it down into a small space, there it is. So here's my air inside. Here was my air before. All compressing does is changes the shape of your gas. It's still air, which is important because if we're going to put it in a scuba tank, we want to breathe it. But its shape has changed. We would call it a physical change because we did not change the identity of what's in it. For the woodworker example, if I take a piece of lumber and cut it into a sculpture, if I have a really big piece of wood and then I whittle away at it until it's a tiny piece of wood, it's still wood. That's going to be physical. I told you there were five physicals. I've already got all five, so the last one must be chemical. But the reason for this is if you combust something, that's the same as igniting it. You just might not be familiar with that terminology. When you put gasoline in your automobile or motorcycle or whatever, and you push the ignition, it starts to burn it. That gives you energy, which allows you to move the vehicle. But when you run out of gas, you can't just get the gas back from out of the air. You can't just pull it out of the air and turn it back into gasoline to use again. you got to go to the gas station and get some more. I hear gas is really cheap right now, so with all the driving that you're doing, I'm sure. We can do a lot of combustion and a lot of chemical changes with that. Those are the answers. If you have any questions, let me know. Uh, I do want to comment on this down here, the homework practice. What is this? And why can't West draw straight lines? It's because it's really hard to draw with a tablet. See, you guys got this. Chemistry's easy. It's not easy, but it does take time, and you just got to put a little thought into it. And with enough practice, you can get there. The homework practice is uh, aimed to reinforce that. If you have the seventh edition of the textbook, then these numbers will line up with my recommended problems that you should do to reinforce the stuff that we covered. So this is actually sections 1.1 through 1.4. So this will ask you questions about like, what's a solid or what is, what does this description describe? Or if I do this to this substance and it turns blue after I mix these two things together, did chemistry happen? And you can go over more examples that you'll see on the online quizzes and on the exams that will be upcoming. Uh, the homework is not due. I will not collect it because I really don't have a way to do it. Um, but I'm more than happy to go over any questions you might have. Take a picture of any problem that would require it. Um, and if you ask about a specific question, make sure you tell me what the problem is asking you. Because if you just ask me, hey, I want to do number seven, your textbook might be slightly different from mine if you have a different edition. For instance, if you bought it off Amazon used versus if you bought it from the bookstore, the problems don't line up exactly. If you aren't sure what problems to do, again, ask me, and I'll guide you through it. All right. Let's keep going on to the next section. Let's put matter into a few categories. In order to do this, we're going to need to have some understanding of what matter is made of. And so as we start to explore certain things... We can make some assumptions about what our matter contains. For example, sugar. Is there an element called sugar? Probably not. There's probably things that sugar is made of. Just like how water is made up of things. I'm going to show you a table that shows you what these things are, which is actually in section 1.7, but I'll show it to you a little bit early. So let's start categorizing matter based on some assumptions that we have. So the first thing I want to show you is water and this delicious cake cake. It's so good. If I had to ask you which of these two things was pure, you wouldn't say the cake. But if you do know where you can get pure cake, let me know because I'm interested. Pure water, though, is something that you could have if you buy a bottle of distilled water from the store. Inside the bottle would be only water. That is the only substance inside it. But inside the cake are a bunch of different things. There's flour, milk, eggs, cream, chocolate, cherries, all those, all that good stuff that makes up cake. We're going to differentiate different forms of matter based on these properties. Is there only one thing, in which case it's a pure substance? Or are there multiple things, in which case it's a mixture? 
So this is going to be our first defining characteristic. To identify the difference between pure substances and mixtures, we want to find whether they have one type of substance or multiple substances. And those substances should be things that you can list off that are not on the periodic table. What is this periodic table? We'll throw it up on the screen in just a second. I'm going to make a flow chart for you. That should look like this. This will help us sort our thoughts on the things that we're working with. So the first question you're going to ask is, is there only one substance in it? And if the answer is yes, it must be a pure substance. If the answer is no, there's a bunch of things in there, then it is a mixture. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to work with pure substances and categorize those. And we'll come back to mixtures in a little bit. On the screen, I have two different forms of matter. One of them is a gemstone. This is a diamond. And the other one is table salt. One of these has multiple elements in it, but we could still consider these substances to be pure. The other is just one type of matter, one type of atom specifically, that makes it up. And of course, we don't really know what the chemical makeup of a diamond is at this point in the class. So I'm just going to tell you. It turns out that diamonds are made of the same thing as pencil lead and charcoal. Diamonds are made of just one element. It's called carbon. Carbon is a specific type of atom. And what an atom is, and we'll talk about this in a little bit more later, is the simplest piece of matter that you can uniquely identify. In other words, if I was to take this diamond and split it into a bazillion pieces and then look at all of those individual pieces, I would find that they are all exactly the same and they're all carbon. If you have only one substance, we're going to call that an element. Elements are found on the periodic table. If you have looked at the periodic table, and let me actually get a periodic table up here for you. So we'll do P table. I'm going to post a link. So if you click on this link in a browser, you'll get a screen that looks not like this. This is the drawing that I drew before. So what I have to do is actually capture the window. That's not the window I want. That's the chat. There we go. So this will take a second. I got to resize it. So we'll do that. There we go. So if you clicked on that link, you'll see something that looks like this. This is the periodic table. And on the periodic table are a bunch of different elements. And you can see as I move the cursor over them, it will highlight which one I'm looking at. The one specifically that we are looking at in this example with diamond is carbon. This is something that you can play around with on your own. If you click on these elements, it will show you more information uh, once it loads. Any day now. Any day now, periodic table. There we go. And it has some information on carbon, which you can't see because it scrolls off the screen here. I can expand it a little bit. So you can read about these elements if you want. This is more just for curiosity, but what's important is that we are able to look at the table and distinguish what the elements are and just become familiar with some names that you are on here. So like carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, lithium, sodium. A bunch of the elements before number 20 are going to be the ones that are important to you because these are common. Uh, stuff down here at the bottom is not so common, so not super useful to you. Uh, later on, we're going to be linking names with symbols, so we will do that at a later time. I'm going to hide the periodic table and go back to this. Now, because we were able to find that one element that was on the screen in our diamond, we can call it an element. If something has more than one element in it, we can't call it an element. We have to call it something different. The word that we use is compound, and a compound has at least two elements in it. There may be more than two. There can be as many as you want, but the point is that there can't be just one. Just one is an element. More than one, two or more, is a compound. What elements are in table salt? You might have heard of it called by a certain name before. And if you can think of it and type it in the chat, you could do that right now. 
But because I'm speaking from the future to you by about 20 or 30 seconds, I'm going to assume that you got it right and that you typed in sodium chloride, which is what table salt is, contains these two things. If I go back to the periodic table, which I've hidden again, let me put it back, and I look for those things on the periodic table, I would find that over here is sodium Na. Over here is chlorine Cl. Those are two different elements in my substance. Therefore, sodium chloride must be a compound. Now, if I really wanted to, I could turn my sodium chloride into regular old sodium by itself, which is a metal, and chlorine gas, which is a yellow gas and is toxic. Both of those are dangerous and bad for you. Table salt, on the other hand, is delicious because the reaction that makes the sodium and the chlorine separately dangerous has already happened to make table salt, and so it is safe. How do we know which things make safe substances and which ones don't? Again, that will come later on. So don't worry too much if you're like, oh, I don't know that. That's, that's fine. I don't expect you to. All right, so those are our pure substances. They're either elements or they are compounds. And I didn't highlight this for some reason. Might as well. For the next part, we're going to talk about mixtures. On the board here, I have two things. One of them is delicious and one of them is not. If you said that ketchup is delicious, congratulations, you are wrong. The correct answer was salad dressing. Ketchup is gross, and I don't like it, but it works really good for this example. In each of these substances, I have a bunch of things that went into making this. So, for example, in ketchup is sugar, tomato, vinegar, uh, spices, I'm going to assume. I actually don't really know what's in ketchup because I don't eat it. Um, but when I make it and I put it in the bottle and then I serve it over, like, french fries or or a hot dog, or what have you. If I use any part of the ketchup, so maybe this side of the container, or this side of the container, or maybe the ketchup that's at the very bottom, and I asked you, is the ketchup in these three segments identical, or is it going to be perceptibly different? Like, could you notice the difference between the ketchup glob on the left and the ketchup glob on the right and the ketchup glob at the bottom? And presumably, you would come to the conclusion that all of this ketchup is identical. The reason for that is because when we make ketchup, we mix it up really, really well. We then serve it, and then it remains in the same state. And so the first squirt of ketchup that comes out of the bottle should taste exactly the same as the last squirt of ketchup. If this is true, then what you're working with is known as a homogeneous mixture. A homogeneous mixture is something that has all portions of its substance exactly the same. In other words, any portion that you take should taste identical. With your soda in the fridge, if you pour four glasses of soda, all four of them should taste the same. That's because soda is also a homogeneous mixture. Now, if I try and do the same thing with my salad dressing down here, if I take this top part right here, and then I also take this bottom part down here, this right here is mostly just oil, because the oil floated to the top. Whereas all the good stuff, all the herbs and spices, sink to the bottom because they're more dense. The two parts that I've circled are very obviously not the same thing. You can tell by the color, you can tell by what's in it. They're very different. If you've had salad dressing and you shake it up, it tries to become a homogeneous mixture. But if you let it sit there for even a little while, it will slowly separate back out into this state. What we'd conclude there is that not every part of the solution is the same. Some of them will be different. In fact, most of them in this case will be different. So if some of them are different, or in other words, all of them are not identical, we call that a heterogeneous mixture. For homogeneous and heterogeneous mixtures, I'm going to give you examples that should be pretty obvious. There is some leeway depending on how closely you look at something. For instance, 
If I asked you about milk, milk, you might think, oh, that's a homogeneous mixture. But if you allow it to like get a little bit of whey or curds on the top, then suddenly it becomes a heterogeneous mixture. How much of that has to happen before we have to change from one description to the other? And the answer is it sort of depends. These aren't hard and fast rules that describe matter. We're just going to use them as general classifications. I'm going to try and give you things that clearly fit into one category over the other. And we're going to try and avoid stuff like blood, which is, it's hard to say if blood is homogeneous or heterogeneous. It depends on how you're thinking about it. Like blood in your bloodstream should be homogeneous because if it wasn't and it passed through certain organs, that could be bad. But if I draw your blood and then store it in a, a uh, like a, an ampule or something like that, and then I separate out the plasma from that, that might be heterogeneous in description. Again, we're going to stick to more simplistic descriptions for our problems. Here's our chart. So again, going down the left side, we concern ourselves with pure substances, which we talked about earlier. For a pure substance, we want to know how many different types of elements there are. If you find only one on the periodic table, we'll call it an element. If you find more than one, we'll call it a compound. Back over on the mixture side, are all the portions exactly the same? And if the answer is yes, we'll call it homogeneous. And if the answer is no, we'll call it heterogeneous. For the problems that you're going to see on the board in just a second, you are going to be tasked with finding out... I, I lost my cursor again. Hold on. My monitor contrast isn't that great. There's my cursor. I'm going to give you something, and you're going to put your something in one of these categories. Okay, so I might give you like a cookie. And then I would ask, is a cookie an element, compound, homogeneous mixture, or heterogeneous mixture? And what you'd have to do is you'd have to go through the, the flow chart here. So we would say, okay, let me get my arrow back. We'd say... That's not the arrow. I don't know where it went. There we go. I say, okay, does my cookie contain only one substance? Well, to make a cookie, you got to put flour and eggs and sugar and stuff like that. So it must be a mixture. Then I would say, okay, are all the parts of the cookie indistinguishable? And I would say, well, if you took a bite of your cookie, would every bite be identical? Let's say it's a chocolate chip cookie. And you'd say, well, maybe one bite might have a lot of chocolate and then the other bite might not those would be different. And what you want to think of is consider all possible situations for your example. Since any two bites of your cookie could have different amounts of chocolate, you'd get a little bit of a different experience, and therefore you would say those substances must be different. Therefore, a cookie must be a heterogeneous mixture. All right, I'm going to put a bunch of examples on the board. First, I'm going to show you some more examples of common things that you might see. For example, copper metal that is used in piping or electric wiring only contains copper. Copper is an element on the periodic table, which you can use that link to find. Sugar is a substance that is not on the periodic table, but you can have a container that has only sugar in it. Sugar actually has a complex chemical formula, which, again, we'll talk about later on in the quarter. For the heterogeneous mixture, oil and water, that's just kind of like our salad dressing example. And then I have a soft drink on the right. A soft drink has an ingredients list. There is more than one ingredient, so it must be a, a mixture. And because you can drink any part of the soft drink and it should taste the same, we'll call it homogeneous. All right, I'm going to give you another set of sample problems. I'm going to let you work on these for about five minutes, then we'll go over the answers, and then we're due for a break. So go ahead and assign one of those four categories to each of these. How many are there on the screen? Seven? Seven, yeah. Again, feel free to use the chat. Remember, you guys got this, especially if you work together. This is a group effort. So go ahead and get to it, and I'll be back in a second after I've checked on my chili. Good luck.
give you a few more minutes to finish up. Or not a few more minutes, sorry, yeah. Just a few more seconds. Alright, let me get my pen back out. And what am I on? I'm on an arrow, so I need a marker. And not that color. Let's do blue. Okay. So let's look at Red Bull. How many of you have drank Red Bull before? Probably everybody, right? That's the one thing that keeps us awake during 5 o'clock lecture. If you spin your can of Red Bull around and you look at the ingredients on the back... Oh, you agreed with me. Oh, no. <laughs> or maybe you're agreeing with the previous person. If you spin your can of Red Bull and look at the ingredients on the back... Oh, no. Everything is terrible. Hold on. Sorry, if I touch the tablet with too many like fingers at once, it thinks that's a key press. If you look at the label of your Red Bull on the back, you'll see that there's a bunch of ingredients in there. So right away off the bat, you know that it's a mixture of some sort. Now, because it's a beverage and manufacturers have gone to great lengths to make sure that every gulp tastes the same, and so that you aren't just drinking the first little bit and then the bottom's like, Ugh. that must make it a homogeneous mixture. There we go. For the second one, I have nail polish remover, and I have indicated that the only ingredient in the nail polish remover that, for this specific example is acetone, and here's its formula. So we can see that there's a carbon, three hydrogens, and that whole thing, there are two of those groups, so there are two CH3s, and another carbon and another oxygen. Now, if this is the only thing that's in there, we know that it can't be a mixture, because that would require us to have multiple substances that we could name. So if acetone is the only thing, now we have to go to the periodic table and look up to see, is there an element called acetone? And it turns out it's not, which is why I gave you the formula. The formula actually contains carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens. That's three different elements, so we're going to call this a compound. For substances like acetone, I will always provide you the formula, because I don't expect you to know the formulas of things like hexane or naphthalene or, or whatever. Like we're, This is an introductory course. We're just starting. So if you don't know something, feel free to look it up. Uh, Wikipedia is always a good answer uh, to give you that information. Uh, even on tests and quizzes, I don't restrict your information. I only restrict the amount of time you get. So if you need to like refer to your notes on a quiz or an exam or whatever, even the final. You can do whatever you want to, but you do have to finish it in the appropriate amount of time. So if there's something you're like, oh, I don't know what acetone is, I'll try and remember to give you that information. But if I don't, you're always allowed to go look it up. All right, here's the important word here, poorly. I had to make some gravel, and so I just threw some stuff in a bag. And uh, here's some sand, here's some rocks, here's some salt, and whatever. There's three things in there, so clearly it's not pure. You can't have pure gravel. But if I mix them really poorly, then I took a scoop out and then laid it on the ground or whatever, none of the scoops that I took out would be the same. Therefore, I almost misspelled heterogeneous. We would call this a heterogeneous mixture. Nitrogen gas, this is an element on the periodic table. If you were curious what the formula for nitrogen gas is, surprise, it's N2. But how many elements are in N2? And it turns out the answer to that is just one, and it's just N. Even though there's two atoms in there, they're both nitrogen. And so there's still only one element present. So we'll call it an element. Now, if you, again, if you didn't know that nitrogen gas was N2, that's okay. We're going to learn that formally later. Uh, I'm sad that nobody gave me their favorite pizza place. Maybe nobody likes pizza. That's okay. Uh, if you make pizza, generally speaking, there's not pure pizza. Again, if you know where you can get pure pizza, let me know. Um, you put a bunch of ingredients on there, and not every bite is going to have the same amount of pepperoni. See, there are people that love pizza. This is good. You're restoring my faith in humanity. 
Since every bite of pizza that you take will not be the same, pizza is a heterogeneous mixture. And pizza is actually a really obvious example because the crust doesn't taste the same as the middle part. In fact, I know some people who don't eat the crust. That's very weird to me because pizza is good all over. Currently, my favorite pizza is Zeke's Pizza. Uh, there's one in Linwood. There's a bunch in Seattle. Uh, it's really expensive, but I love Zeke's Pizza. Iron Metal, that's also an element. That's right off the periodic table. I don't know what happened to that letter E there. Let me fix it. Costco Pizza is really good for what it costs. All right, here was the confusing one that people were discussing. Oh, no, I've opened the can of worms. Pineapple on pizza. I'm going to finish this question, and I'll let you guys argue that during the break. Steel metal. What is steel? In fact, steel is a family of substances that is called an alloy. Oops, I missed a letter in there. So an alloy is a bunch of molten metals mixed together. And what happens when you make steel or any other alloy, which I'll give you a bunch of examples in a second, is you take your iron, your chromium, your manganese, nickel, and carbon, and you throw them all in a vat, and you turn on the heating element, and you heat it up until it's really, really, really hot. So hot that they start to melt, and then they mix together. And then you stir it really well, so that you have a nice mixture. So obviously this is a mixture that we're going for, and not a compound. Once everything is mixed and you allow it to cool... Then you have a hard, stiff material that is identical no matter where you test it. So one part of the steel isn't going to be any different than the other parts. Because when we make the steel, we want it to be all the same. Otherwise, we couldn't build with it. So what that means is that steel metal must be a homogeneous mixture. Oh, goodness. I held down a button and everything freaked out. Hold on. On my pen are buttons that I don't want to push, and if I do push them, bad things happen. I just got to go disable that. I didn't realize that was a thing. Now, interestingly, all alloys are also homogeneous mixtures. So whether your alloy is bronze or brass or electrum, electrum is a mixture of silver and gold. All of them are homogeneous mixtures. Pineapple on pizza is gross, and we're going to take a break. So the way that the break works is that I put this on the screen... I do this so that the break appears. I turn the timer on, which is actually disappeared off my screen. So let me get that real quick. Uh, there's a question there. So just a second. Let me finish what I'm doing here. Where is my timer? There it is. So now I should be able to do this. And we'll go back to this real quick because somebody had a question. Oh, is there a typo on my slides? Uh, use the numbers that are on my uh, presentation. The slides might actually be an old version that I just haven't gotten around to updating. Maybe because I wasn't aware of it that there was a problem. Um, so for the homework practice for this section, you do want to do 123 to 140. Uh, 123 to 126 may have been an old textbook that I have since changed. Okay. Uh, again, if you have other questions like that, let me know. Also, send me an email to say, like, hey, the slides are wrong. Can you fix these? And I'll, I'll do that. I'm going to put the title card up. Uh, I'm going to start the timer for the break. I will see you in 10 minutes. And I'm going to play the music because I can't have it playing nothing uh, over that long of a period. Thank you. 
I didn't unmute my thing. <laughs> ah! No, I hid the announcement. Hold on. There we go. That's what I want. Yeah, there is so much delicious food out there that I'm not eating right now, and I'm very sad about it. I've lost, like, 10 pounds. Which is a shame. <laughs> I eat out a lot. Like, I'm, I'm almost ashamed to say that I eat out probably like five or six times a week. Um, mostly because I don't have time because I go to the college and then I want to eat at Taco Book and I miss Taco Book more than anything. All right, back to the lecture. Uh, the last few sections are pretty quick. We're going to talk about the periodic table, which I've already introduced to you. So we were mentioning elements earlier before. Uh, I got to move something real quick. There we go. We were mentioning elements before that they are the basic building blocks of all of the matter that is around us. You can put together any combination of elements that you want and you will get some form of molecule. Uh, most of the molecule combinations are not stable, so you can't go putting like platinum together with carbon and expect it to work in every way. But there are many particular combinations that do work. Here are just some examples of various elements off the periodic table. I found some pictures that I was like, oh, this is pretty uh, demonstrative of what these things look like in ways that you may expect or maybe you don't. So, for example, on the left, I have iodine. You're probably familiar with iodine f from, like, wound cleaning in the 70s or the 60s. Or maybe you had a grandparent who had a bottle of this purple liquid. And if you cut yourself, she would say, let me get the iodine. And then you would put it on your arm to disinfect it or whatever. Molybdenum is a metal that nobody has ever heard of. I don't I don't know what it is. Nobody knows anything about it. It's a mystery. But here's a picture. Now, molybdenum is a metal that is used... Uh, it's used in steel. Uh, it's used for other things. I think it's used in magnets. Um, I don't know much about it. But it looks cool. There it is. Sulfur is very common. So sulfur is the thing that makes many substances look yellow. Uh, 
In eggs, the yolk contains a high amount of sulfur, which makes it yellow. Um, of particular importance in, uh, for sulfur is that it is found in specific uh, proteins and peptides so that they make interesting shapes in your protein folding. Um, obviously, it doesn't occur in the solid form that you see here. This is just a sulfur crystal. On the right, I put calcium in here because calcium is the one that probably looks very weird to you. If you have encountered calcium, 99% likely it's been from milk. This metal is not floating around in chunks in your milk. In fact, what it is existing as is the ionized form. And the calcium precipitates a protein, which makes it very, very white. Uh, calcium is the main component of your bones and stuff. But the elemental calcium that you see on the screen here is very different than the calcium that we see in bones and teeth and things like that. Those are calcium when it occurs as a compound. And again, we'll talk more about ionic compounds and covalent compounds in chapters 4 and 5 later on. Uh, this is the periodic table. I don't know why it showed up last, but there's a little screen. Um, that note that is in red is not relevant to you because you will not be taking the final exam booklet that we use for Chem 121. Uh, you're going to take a final exam online and you get to use whatever periodic table you want. So you can have all the names, you don't have to memorize anything. Um, so this page is mostly just a warning that is never going to happen. You get to have any periodic table you want, I don't care. Uh, but there is some important stuff in here, and can I zoom in here? Like, can I do that? No, because one of my buttons isn't actually doing what I think it should. Let's see here. Do I have a zoom? I don't know what this button does. I don't want to push it. Okay. If you look at the periodic table, you'll actually see that there are some elements that look very different in terms of their symbol, but their names are very similar. So for example, if I asked you where was potassium on the periodic table, you might look over here and be like, oh, there's P, and this is actually phosphorus right here. Potassium's over here, it's K. Why the heck does calcium, or not calcium, sorry, why the heck does potassium have K for its periodic uh, symbol? And the reason for that is because like all problems on the periodic table, we have the ancient Romans to thank for this. So this symbol, and a lot of these are actually in Latin. So for instance, K is actually called Callium, but nobody calls it that in America. So we call it potassium here. You do not need to know the Latin names, uh, but what you do need to know is that potassium, you have to write the symbol K to represent it. We don't get to change that part we can use whatever name is appropriate for our language, but the symbols themselves are universal. The symbol K, which is this, this vertical line with this bent line like that, that symbol is universal. Anybody in any language set that is a chemist would recognize the letter K uh, as potassium. Okay. Now, Identifying elements by their name can be kind of tedious, especially since we want to write shorthand to make this a lot simpler on us to notate. So we use one or two letter chemical symbols to do this. Those are the symbols on the periodic table that you just saw. Uh, most of the symbols make sense. Again, some of them are derived from other languages. Most of those languages are, are Latin. The one that the German... Uh, that Germany found first, I guess, is tungsten. It's called Wolfram over there, which is a W, and I guess they decided, yeah, we want a stake on the periodic table too. And we're like, okay, sure, you can have W. I'm fond of W because that means I can spell my name with periodic table elements. Uh, the other one I have to use is Einsteinium, which is also classy. Uh, hooray. What I want you to do is on your periodic table, using that P table link that I had, I want you to try and look around for these elements and just sort of familiarize yourself with the periodic table. I'm going to bring it up in just a second. Uh, in fact, I could probably just do that now. While you guys are doing that, let me put the periodic table... Oops, that's not what I meant to do, but that's okay. Let's copy this, and we'll paste it here. We'll paste a duplicate. That's not at all what I wanted. Hold on. Oh, I tried to put my timer on there. That window doesn't exist, so I need to find it. So cancel. Okay. 
put it over there. We'll show it. And then I got to make it smaller. There it goes. So that's probably a lot bigger on your screen than it is on mine. So hopefully that will help you. But what I want you to do is look around the periodic table, try and find those elements, and I'll give you a few seconds to do that. All right, hopefully you found all of them. So let's find them one at a time here. So where is iron? Iron lives somewhere on the periodic table. Where is it? I don't think it's capturing my mouse cursor, unfortunately. But it's right here. It's number 26. Lithium is number 3. That's way over here. Nitrogen is number 7. There it is. Uranium is one of the important metals because we use it for nuclear power. It's way down here, number 92. Platinum is important to me because I was a platinum chemist in graduate school. I did my uh, degree on platinum chemistry. Basically, I turned it into chemical waste. Platinum's right here. It's number 78. Then we got tungsten. Tungsten is used for things that need to get really, really, really hot. Tungsten has a really high melting point. And that's number 74. Tin is one of those tricky ones that you might try and find and think, oh, it's right here, it's TI, but that's actually titanium. Tin actually lives over here, it's number 50. It is SN for stanum, which again is Latin. Fluorine is number nine. Fluorine is important because it's in toothpaste. And that helps strengthen your teeth. Uh, you do not need to know what element they are in terms of like a test. So for example, I'm not going to be like, quick, tell me what element 34 is. And then time is up or something like that. No, I'm not going to do that. Um, 
as you look at the periodic table, you will develop more of a, like, oh, I remember it's kind of on the right or something. That's generally good enough. If you know where carbon is and you know it's number six, then that will save you some time in trying to find it on the table. Because remember, again, time is your opponent here, really, in this class, is in terms of, like, the assessments and stuff. So if I give you a periodic table and I say, find carbon and oxygen and then add their numbers together or something like that, and you're like, where's oxygen? And you go through the periodic table and you can't find it. That could take up a lot of time. So knowing generally where things is, things are will help you, uh, but you're not required to memorize them. Sodium is over here. We've already talked about it, and I think we already talked about phosphorus. Sodium was 11, and phosphorus was 15. All right, let me hide this guy. Boop. He is left the building. Homework practice for this section is 43 through 56. Uh, that is a selection of problems that just basically help you find your way around the periodic table and establish the difference between an element and a compound. All right. There's not much left to do in this lecture, so let's do the last section. Chapter 1 is really short. That's why we do it on the first day. Let's talk a little bit about atoms and molecules in detail and show some ways that we can describe them. First off, what is an atom conceptually? I've been using this word a lot, and for some reason your textbook puts it at the very end, and I do these chapters in order, so I don't, you, I don't want you to get confused on where the material is. But conceptually speaking, what is an atom? And I'm going to use this example to help try and illustrate that. Let's suppose that you had a sheet of copper, and for some reason it's blue. I don't know. I think I tried to do this in red, and it was just hard to see. I'm going to take that sheet of copper, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut it in half like this. Boop. And then I'm going to do that again. Boop. And I'm going to do it again and again and again. Boop, 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 boop. And I'm just going to keep cutting this piece of copper in half until I get to the point where I can't cut it in half anymore. I will have reached the limit of what is copper. And in fact, if I tried to cut that last piece of copper in half, what I would end up with was something totally different. I wouldn't have copper anymore. That tiny, tiny, tiny particle of copper that we have left is what we call an atom. And atoms are really, really small. I mean, like, if I were to put a little dot on the screen here. Boop, there's my dot. That dot would contain quintillions of atoms if that were, like, dry eraser ink on the screen. Atoms are extremely small, which is why I had to cut this in half 60 million times. More than that, actually. Probably like 60 quintillion times. Now, in doing this, here's an interesting question. If I'm cutting this copper sheet into pieces, did I do a physical or chemical change? Noting that before, here's what I started with. And at the end, here's what I ended with. Hopefully you know the answer to that because we did the first section. But just in case you forgot, it is indeed a physical change. Uh, this next part has a YouTube video which I would love to link. Unfortunately, I probably shouldn't air it on my channel because it will get me a copyright strike. It's nothing that is inappropriate with the video. It's just that it's very, very famous. And I don't know if that's appropriate. So I'm going to paste the link into the chat when I get there. But for the time being, I do want to talk about what an atom is and how we get them. So on the screen, I have a picture of a pie chart that shows the elemental composition of the sun. It turns out that the sun is like 91% hydrogen, about 8% helium. And then everything else is this itty bitty teeny tiny piece right here that you can't even see. And that magnified is this, and these are all the other elements. So most of the sun is hydrogen. And in fact, most of the universe ha is hydrogen. Now, why do I say this? This is important to note because in order to figure out what atoms really are, we have to know where all of this matter came from. In the previous example, I noted that all of the copper that we got would be reduced down to a single atom. Does the atom that we chose matter? It turns out that it doesn't. In any sample of an element, all of the atoms are going to be 
identical. So every atom of copper in our sample will be the same. Now, if that's true for copper, that must be true for everything else, which implies that we have constructed copper from pieces, and those pieces must be identical to ensure every atom of copper is the same. Now, where are those pieces from? And what do they mean? And what I would link to you to understand that is this video. If you recognize the words, how did this happen? You probably know which video I want to link you. I don't want to add to the favorites. Let me do this really quickly. So if I click on this, I don't know if you could actually hear that because I hit mute. Okay. So I'm going to paste a link in here. And so you don't have to watch this now because I'm going to talk over it. But the relevant part that you want to watch is from that timestamp. So it starts at 11 and it goes to about a minute 50. It's a 20 minute video, but this is a very popular video. It's called History of the Entire World, I guess. And it's by a guy named Bill Wirtz. And his shtick is that he sings parts while he's doing it in a really funny sort of musical way. Uh, but the first minute is a little background on where stuff comes from uh, in terms of elements. And so the short version, so that you can watch the video later and see this, is that all elements are composed from really tiny pieces. And those pieces get crammed together to make hydrogen. And then those hydrogen atoms get crammed together to make helium. And we cram more stuff together in the core of a star until we get whatever element we want. So basically everything comes from protons and neutrons and electrons, which are by themselves simple pieces that we can use to make hydrogen and then we can cram that together. So all of the elements on the periodic table, which should still be here, there it is, all of them come from these pieces and we're allowed to distinguish them however we want to in terms of counting what those pieces are. Those individual tiny objects will then be used to do chemical reactions. If I take some of those individual atoms off that periodic table and I stick them together, the result that I get is called a molecule. And I have some illustrations on the next slide that aren't so great at, at showing that, unfortunately. But I can draw some stick figures in and hopefully accommodate that. Some examples of molecules would be H2O that we talked about before. H2O, for example, is a molecule because there are three different atoms. Two of them are H, which is hydrogen, and one of them is oxygen, which is the O. I counted that wrong with my fingers, and I'm glad that you can't see me counting to two incorrectly. This is why I'm not broadcasting my face, other than this little picture in the corner. Other molecules exist, like oxygen is O2. There are two oxygen atoms that are bonded together. Bonds are just forces that hold molecules together. So if I grab my pen, if I were to draw H2O, actually, let's go to the to the this thing, which shouldn't have that anymore. I'm not really sure why that's still there. Oh, there we go, because I didn't update it. Okay. So if I were to draw a molecule of H2O, so here's my oxygen, and here's my hydrogens, and they're coming out of it. These right here are my atoms. And the whole thing is my molecule. Now, these lines that I have drawn right here, those lines, which I've indicated with a black arrow, those are my bonds. And this is also a bond over here. Uh, I don't know why that cursor popped up. What this molecule is, is essentially three atoms that are stuck together, and the bonds are kind of like tethers. You can think of it as like I have atoms that are connected by a rope or a spring or something like that. If I move the H atom in some direction, everything else comes along with it, because they're all bonded together. Molecules are stuck in this way, and chemistry is the uh, exploration of how these bonds interact with other things. We could break the bonds, we could make new bonds, we make new substances. If all of the bonds remain intact, then what we're doing is physics, and that would be a physical change or manipulation. 
when I heat water, I don't break any of the bonds in water. It's just H2O. The, it all stays together. It just The molecules separate from their neighbors. If I freeze it, all of the molecules line up with each other. We're going to talk more about bonds in more detail in chapters 4 and 5, because bonding is very important. But the take-home message for this lecture is that we just care about what our molecules are in terms of their symbology. All right. On this next slide, we're going to start categorizing molecules using some terms that this doesn't really come up super much, but it's in your textbook, so I feel obligated to talk about it. We're going to categorize molecules by two different classifications. The first is the number of atoms that are present in our molecule, and that's going to be as simple as counting up the number of atoms in the formula. So for example, if I had this formula, A, B, 2. What I would say is that there is one atom and then two more atoms. And so I would say, since there's one A and two B, there would be three atoms present. And if I have three atoms, then I would have to give it the name that would be for three, which is down here. So I would call this molecule, this AB2 molecule, triatomic. We have a bunch of names depending on how many atoms are present in the molecule. Something that is monatomic actually is in the molecule, but we still have a term for it anyway. If there's only one atom, we call it monatomic. If there are two atoms joined together by a bond, whether they are the same or different, we call it diatomic. If there are three, we call it triatomic. And if there are more than three atoms present, we don't have any more number terms for that because that just gets too ridiculous. We call that polyatomic. So more than three is polyatomic, monatomic is one, diatomic is two, triatomic is three. So that's the first categorization. The second categorization is by type. And we're going to look at what types of atoms are present in our molecule. When I say type, I mean, are they all the same type? Are they all the same element? Or are there different types? And we distinguish types of atoms in these pictures by using color. So if I give you these two pictures, on the left I have two atoms, but they're both the same color. What that depicts is that they are the same type of atom. In this case, they're actually oxygen. But again, you don't need to know that red means oxygen. On the right, I have two different types of atoms. I have one black atom and two red atoms. They're all bonded together in that molecule but there are different types present. We're going to use the same kind of language that we used with classifying mal uh, matter earlier to describe whether it's all the same, which we would say homoatomic, or whether there are differences, and we would say heteroatomic. So, ah, why did that happen? Sorry. Technical difficulties will happen. So... There we go. I just want to highlight this for you. Let me know if the highlighting is helpful. If not, I can stop doing it. I realize that the pages suddenly flipping is not helpful. That's something I'm going to just have to deal with. All right. So what I want you to do is on the top, I have drawn three pictures of molecules. I want you to give them a classification, and I want you to either use homoatomic or heteroatomic to describe it, but I also want you to use, and I don't know if I can get a different color here. I can. Let's do this color. I also want you to categorize them as either monatomic, diatomic, triatomic, or, heter or polyatomic. So you should have one term from the yellow highlighter and one term from the purple highlighter for each of the pictures. Okay, cool. I like it if, I like it if you like it. Now up here on the pictures, let me get my cursor back here. These three pictures are three different problems. Down here, these are just formulas. But if you were to draw them as pictures, you could then do the same thing. But ultimately, we're going to want to move away from pictures just because the pictures take a long time for me to draw. So I want you to assign one of each of those two categories for problem number one, number two, number three, number four, five, and six. 
I'll give you a few minutes to do that. And then when we come back, we'll go over the answers because this is the last slide. We'll be done with chapter one and we'll call it a day. So I'll see you in a bit. My neighbors are playing really loud music downstairs, and I can't hear it when I put my headset on, so I'm going to assume that you guys can't hear it either. I know, who plays loud music on a Tuesday at 6.48? <laughs> Apparently my neighbors. Uh, another minute to finish these up. Okay, cool. I mean, I can barely hear them. I mean, it's not bad music. I mean, they're musicians, I guess, or something. I don't know. They play music every day. Like, I don't even know what instrument it is. It sounds like a bass guitar, is my guess. That's what I can hear. They might even just be playing Guitar Hero. I really don't know. It's not music I recognize. It sounds pretty simple. Which makes me think, oh, it's just somebody practicing on their instrument. So. Let's go over the answers. Let me make sure I don't have the highlighter selected. I don't. Okay, cool. So for number one, I have one, two, three atoms in my molecule. They are all the same. Let's start with the counting. Since there are three, I would categorize this as triatomic. And because they are all identical atoms, I would categorize this as homoatomic. All right. Number two, there are one, two, three, four, five atoms here. Five is larger than the triatomic limit that we have, so we're going to call it polyatomic. And because one of them is different, this one is different than the others, we're going to call it heteroatomic. Oh, is there a problem with the chapter one? I'm going to have to look at that. I can re-upload I, I re a copy of the PDF with the correct numbers on it. I'm not sure why that happened. I'll look through chapter two and see if that happened. On that too. Um, 
But yeah, thanks for bringing that to my attention. I'll, I'll make sure to look at that. Number three, there's only one thing here. So it's going to be monotonic. And because there is only one atom here, it can never be anything other than homoatomic. Down on number four, there are two types of atoms, and the number of atoms present is a little hard to tell without the pictures, but we can say that there are six carbons and six hydrogen, which means there must be 12. 12 is way larger than three, so this must be polyatomic. And because there are two different types of atoms here, it is heteroatomic. On uh, number five, I lost my cursor again. There it is. There is only one type of atom, and there are two of those atoms. So we would say diatomic and homoatomic. And then finally, for number six, two types, three total atoms. So here's my one, there's my two. So this would be triatomic, heteroatomic, heteroatomic. All right. Oops, I misclicked there. Uh, do I have an eraser? I do have an eraser. There we go. All right. So there's the homework practice. That's the correct homework practice. I'm going to update that uh, sometime tomorrow. Uh, and I will upload all the PDFs again after double checking which ones have mistakes in them. Because I should have your copies. I have like 30 copies. I'm reading your questions here. So let's see. Monatomic, diatomic, triatomic, polyatomic. So that is as far as we go in this class. So we don't go like to tetraatomic. That is a word that exists. But you're going to need to put one of those words, monatomic, diatomic, triatomic, or polyatomic, and one of the homoatomic or heteroatomic to describe any molecule I give to you. So I might say like CS2. CS2 would have three atoms, a C and two S's. That would be triatomic. And because there is a C and an S and those are different elements, that would be heteroatomic. All right, the next thing that you must do is celebrate. Oh, no, no, hold on. I have extra slides here. I apparently have like a slide that talks about how to write formulas. Uh, we've been doing this all period. So writing formulas is actually pretty trivial. Uh, if I give you a description, you should be able to turn that into a formula. Important thing to note that we don't write ones in chemical formulas. I think there is one more slide after this that just has, like, count how many atoms there are. I'm not going to make you stick around for 10 minutes to just count atoms. Um, I will let you do that on your own. But again, here is the homework practice for this section. 73 through 88. I'll let you copy that down. And then I hope the sound effect that's on the next slide isn't too loud, because now you celebrate... <laughs> we're done. So if you have any other questions, feel free to put them in the chat. I will answer questions for the next like five minutes before we close the stream. So a question came up. Do we always have to specify that a monatomic is homoatomic? Um, for the purposes of our assignments, it's safe to do that just to provide all the information that is asked based on who is asking you the question. I will be able to interpret that obviously something that is monatomic will be homoatomic. But as far as a conceptual test, if I specifically ask you, put this, put a name for each of the categories for all of these, then I'll want you to do both, either the count name or the type name for every example, and not just have one example where it's like, oh, it's monatomic, and like, well, where's the other one? So do do both. However, outside of this classroom, if you said monatomic, other people would understand that, yeah, that's homatomic. All right, that's the end of chapter one. Chapter one is pretty straightforward. That's why we can finish it on the first day. 
Chapter 2 is much longer. We're going to spend a little bit longer on Chapter 2 than we did on Chapter 1 because there is a lot of math. You will want to bring a calculator, and you will also want to read the chapter and understand how dimensional analysis works. So make sure that you are up to scratch on that. I'm going to put the title card back up. Uh, you can't see the chat anymore, but it should still be along the side there. If you have any questions, I'm going to leave the stream up for about three more minutes. Thanks for coming up by, and I will see you on Thursday. Remember, no lecture tomorrow, so you get a day off. See you then, and thanks for watching.